As a child of rural Iowa and of a family that dedicated their lives to corporate factories as welders and line painters, I can't help but wonder how many people like me actually exist working in museums. And I can tell you from the classrooms of a Georgetown Museum Studies program and the lecture halls of the Sotheby's of Art Institute program, I felt really alone and singular in my experience and perspectives. Don't get me wrong, I will never get sick of telling my novelty drive a tractor to school day stories at parties, but when it came to our intellectual discussions around what a museum has been and what it should become, I felt very outnumbered by children of wealth. Children who grew up around arts and culture and went to LACMA on their family vacations. I didn't step foot into an art museum until I went to college. And for my family vacations, we went rural trout fishing in Wisconsin, uh, without power, I might add. So. When I would sit in these classrooms, in these discussions, wanting so badly to dedicate myself to museums for the purpose of accessibility and to ensure that museums and art could be for all people and not just upper classes. And I know, I know I'm not alone in that pursuit. Like I know lots of museums work towards those goals and there are articles written about how we might pursue those goals as, as a field. Um, but I also know that it's not all museums working towards that goal. And some days I wonder if it's even most of us that are working towards that goal. And I still remember sitting in my first interview after grad school with the director of education at a museum that I won't name here. And I poured my heart out for three hours about accessibility and rural outreach and innovative ways museums could uh, attract underserved populations and serve them. And she looked me in the eye at the end of this interview and almost like she felt sorry for me. She said, your passion is inspiring, really it is, but I don't see underserved populations visiting our museum. And for that reason, I don't see how your passion is going to serve this institution. So yeah, I didn't get that job. But that conversation was still really important, I think, for me to hear and for me to fully understand what the museum problem was. And we could have the whole, if you build it, they will come sort of conversation. Like if we made really cool exhibitions and programs that were interesting to all people, then maybe all people would come. But that's just not the truth. It's not Field of Dreams. The fact is you can't escape the fact that museums for centuries have been built by and for elite circles of people who collect things. That's the history. And in a lot of ways, it still is our present. But I don't, I don't want this whole conversation to be like, here's everything wrong with museums, here are the inherent problems. Instead, I want to take what I've learned in museums so far and present a solution that I've found. So I didn't get that job, but cut forward a little bit, I got an educator position at the National Czech and Slovak Museum and Library in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And early on, um, when I first started, the museum had just been dabbling in project-based learning, which means they worked with local high school students um, and enriched their classrooms with long-term projects that the museum designed. And they had just started that process and I was learning the ropes. Uh, I learned that one of our strongest school partners was Metro High School, where they hosted Metro STEAM Academy, which was a class that students could take to work on our projects. And um, I learned that Metro High School was comprised of 100% at-risk students. 100% students who represented underserved populations. And I realized that they were, these, these were students who worked part-time jobs like I did in high school to help with family bills and pay for their car. And they were students with learning disabilities. And these were the students that that woman in that interview had basically told me were never going to visit museums. And after a year of working with them, I very quickly realized that not only would they visit museums, but they were going to be the greatest asset to our museum in terms of education, exhibitions, and outreach. So um, about a year in, I made my first pitch to Metro High School and the students, and my pitch was this. What if, in honor of the 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall, we build a 60-foot long replica of the Berlin Wall in our community? 
So yeah, they kind of thought I was delusional. But shortly thereafter that pitch, me and three of those educators were out in the vacant lot next to the museum mapping out where we thought the wall was going to go. So they clearly didn't think I was that crazy because they had the vision and the excitement to go stand in a vacant lot and count out 60 steps to see where our wall might be someday in the future. And I took a photo of that moment because I was like, if we're actually crazy enough to do this, we need this first physical step, literally, memorialized. So we started working with students that fall to design the wall, what materials we were going to use. I recruited tons and tons of um, mentors from the community who worked in construction, architecture, engineering, um, materials production. And students worked with these adult professional mentors uh, to refine their design and eventually build it. We worked with excavators and um, the goal was always that this wall was going to be more than just a wall. It was going to be a community art space. It was going to host uh, art residencies and, and programs and lectures. It was going to be the forefront of our 2019 year. And so when I would watch a student sitting down with a structural engineer calculating in complex math that I can't follow the thickness of the wall so that it could withstand 60 mile per hour Iowa winds, I don't think that student was like, cool, I'm getting science credit. I think he was like, yeah, I really don't want this wall to blow down because it's going to be in my community and I want to make a difference. And that's so much more powerful than a science worksheet or something like that. So the wall gets built um, through incredible partnerships with these students and those mentors. And we used the wall for six months. Uh, at the museum in all those educational programmings I talked about um, and the most incredible thing was that we saw almost immediately and w without direct effort that Metro students wanted to come to all of those programs. They wanted to come to the art lectures from an Egyptian artist who talked about the Egyptian Revolution. Like they wanted to come sit and listen to him talk for an hour which like if you know teenagers and you work with teenagers it's kind of crazy that they would give you that on their Saturday evening. But they did, and they brought their friends, and they took photos with the artist like he was a celebrity. And <laughs> these were the folks that I was told would, would be almost impossible to get to come to a museum. And they were coming to the museum like it was just where they hung out, where, where things happened for them, because they built the thing that was in the backyard, and they had been a million times to, to, to build it. So it was just a regular part of their day, or their weekend, or their evening that they might be here. And that was maybe my proudest accomplishment as an educator is that we built this sense of belonging for those students because their classroom had been the vacant lot next to our museum and it had been our exhibits in our classroom and my office. So we build the wall, it becomes this backdrop for all these programs. It got painted by the public every day. We hosted free art supplies and anybody and everybody who came to the museum could go and paint it. It was a photo shoot backdrop for so many photographers and I saw senior photos taken in front of it, I saw a student rap video filmed in front of it. I even heard that it was a Pokemon Go stop on the phone game. <laughs> so it was beloved, truly, but our plan had always been to tear it down. So on November 19th, 2019, 30 years after the fall of the, the original Berlin Wall, we invited our students, the mentors, their families, the teachers to come and help us tear that wall down as a symbolic gesture that we were constantly going to be working towards solidarity and democracy and freedom of speech and that no walls anywhere should exist to separate people. And in 2019, you might remember this is the height of when certain groups in the United States were talking about building a border wall on the U.S.-Mexico border. And so it was really apt at this moment that we were going to symbolically tear down this symbol of division and hate and oppression. And as I watched my students and their grandparents and their younger siblings take chunks of this wall off with their sledgehammers, I couldn't help but feel this overwhelming sense of hope. Hope for our country, for our community, for the next generation that I was proudly watching swing sledgehammers. And all of that hope rested on the shoulders and the hard work of the underserved populations that allegedly would never visit museums. It's pretty incredible. <laughs>